What's up everybody? In this video I will be building the outfield seats and this includes another iconic feature of Wrigley Field, the Ivy. How am I going to make it out of paper? So you just have to watch and find out. That's what they call a tease in the business. I'm going to cover two things about Wrigley Field history while you watch this video. The first will be the Ivy and the second thing I'm going to talk about are lights. Let's talk about the Ivy first, and that story starts in 1937 when the Cubs announced plans to rebuild the center field bleachers out of concrete instead of wood. Part of that project included a 12 foot tall brick outfield wall that would have been, oh my goodness, that's a, I, this is like my 55th take and I finally said that, that's a tongue twister. 12 foot tall brick outfield wall that would be included, that would, oh my god, now I can't remember what I was supposed to say. And eventually that brick outfield wall would be covered by ivy. There you go, I got it. Another part of that project was the gigantic out of town manually operated scoreboard that still stands in center field today. Just a few years after the bleachers were built, Cubs owner PK Wrigley and President Bill Veck Jr. were on a mission to beautify Wrigley Field. This was when the marquee was installed and also when the ivy was planted. You see, back then, brick was simply viewed as a building material. It wasn't seen as beautiful or anything that was aesthetically pleasing. Think of it the way that we look at cinder blocks these days. So the Cubs covered it up with ivy because leaves are pretty. Ivy was also planted on the exterior brick walls, but this idea was abandoned because people kept stealing the ivy plants on the outside of the stadium before they even got a chance to flourish. Now you might be familiar with the basket, which is an angling, changling fence that runs along the top of the outfield wall. This wasn't installed until the 1970 season, and mostly is because during the 1969 pennant race, when the Cubs were getting gigantic crowds that filled up the bleachers, there was a huge problem with fans reaching over the wall and interfering with deep fly balls, and also a couple incidences of fans falling on the field. You would think people wouldn't be able to fall on the field anymore because of the basket, but unbelievably where there's a will, there's a way, and it still happens every once in a while. One more unique challenge of the Ivy is that balls get stuck in it all the time. If it happens during the game, it's simply a ground rule double. Now, let's talk about lights, baby. Let's talk about lights at Wrigley. I really put myself out there singing that, and from the bottom of my heart, I hope you enjoyed it. You might be asking yourself, why are lights significant? Every ballpark has them, right? Especially big league ballparks. Well, for 40 years between 1948 and 1988, Wrigley was the only major league ballpark that did not have lights. Every single game played at Wrigley for those years was a day game. Even though the Cubs didn't play a night game until 1988, there were a few instances of night games at Wrigley Field. On July 1st, 1943, teams from the All-American League, which was a women's professional softball league, played an exhibition game at Wrigley Field as part of a Women's Army Corps recruiting rally. There was nearly 7,000 fans in attendance, with temporary lights set up behind home plate and along the first and third base lines. This was the first night event of any kind at Wrigley Field. The next year, the All-American Girls Baseball League, which you might recognize from a league of their own, would play the second ever night game at Wrigley. And as I touched on in my last video, the Harlem Globetrotters also brought in temporary lights to play a night game at Wrigley Field in 1954. So even though these examples proved that there was a market or an interest for night games at Wrigley Field, the Wrigley family, who obviously owned the Cubs, had no interest in adding lights. In fact, it became a source of pride that the Cubs still played baseball by sunlight, the old school way. The only time they were close to caving was in the 1940s. Plans were even drawn up to finally install lights to Wrigley Field. But these plans were scrapped after Pearl Harbor entered the United States in the World War II, and all new construction was completely banned in the United States. Another thing that World War II delayed for baseball was baseball's move to the West. You see, the St. Louis Browns were planning to move west to Los Angeles, but that move was canceled because of travel limits during World War II. Instead, the Browns moved to Baltimore 12 years later and became the Baltimore Orioles. 
And obviously, the Dodgers moved from Brooklyn to Los Angeles to become the Los Angeles Dodgers. So if it wasn't for World War II, we might have the Los Angeles Orioles and the Baltimore Dodgers. Back to lights at Wrigley. When the Tribune Company bought the Cubs in 1981, they saw night games as a chance for additional revenue. However, the neighborhoods around Wrigley resisted and even passed an ordinance completely banning night games. The Tribune Company fought back by threatening to move the Cubs out of the city of Chicago. There were several times when the Cubs were close to moving to the suburbs. Plans were even made for a park in Arlington Heights, Rosemont, and Schaumburg, Illinois. Let me know if I pronounced that wrong if you happen to know how to pronounce Schaumburg. Land was even purchased for that Schumburg ballpark. And even though the Cubs obviously didn't move there, a minor league stadium was eventually built on that land. Boomer Stadium is still in use today. After years of bickering, the final nail in the no night games coffin came from Major League Baseball, who determined the Cubs could not host a home playoff game until they had lights. Locals finally caved and changed the city ordinance to allow the Cubs to play eight night games a year. That ordinance was eventually changed to 18, and today it stands at 30 night games a year. That's 30 out of 82 home games every year. That means night games are still a pretty big event at Wrigley Field. In 1988, when the Cubs finally played their first night game, it got rained out. The highlight of the Cubs' first night game ended up being Greg Maddox sliding across the tarp, a stunt that he was fined $500 for. That's all I got for you guys this week. Make sure to keep tabs on this project because I'm winding down to the end and I'm going to be putting this baby on eBay and you might have a chance to win it. Like, comment, subscribe, and I will catch you on the flippity flip. 12 foot tall brick outfield wall.